Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to my JavaScript Crash Course for Beginner Series. What I'm going to talk about today is variables. Specifically, what I'll cover is what is a variable and why are they necessary in programming. And then we'll get to how to create and use them in JavaScript, and we'll also go over some examples. Now, if you remember back to my first tutorial, I have my environment set up already. I've already opened my terminal window and launched my Python server. On the left side of the screen, I've got my editor open. This time I've got it nicely zoomed in instead of having to do that in post, so you'll be able to see everything a lot more clearly. On the right, I've got Chrome open, so we're going to go and open developer tools now. Get the console showing. And let's navigate to localhost. So we've got the index.html page showing, we've got that loaded, and so we're all ready to go. And if I make any modifications to the files and hit reload, everything should just start appearing in the browser and console, just like the previous JS tutorial. So let's go and do that. To begin, what are variables and how do they work? Now, keep in mind, this whole thing, this tutorial on JavaScript is for absolute beginners. If you're confident that you're super familiar with what variables are and just want to skip ahead, then by all means, go ahead. But we should make this section pretty brief anyway. So what are variables? Variables are really a fundamental tool or concept in programming. They act as containers for a piece of information. Stepping away from the computer for a minute, if you imagine that you're sitting at dinner trying to figure out the total cost of you and your friend's meal, let's assume that every meal is only a main course in a drink. Now you could just say, well, my burger was $10 and my drink was four and their fish and chips was 12 and they didn't have a drink. That would be So that would be $26 in total. And that works and you've got your answer, but if we tweak the problem a little bit now and you were to describe this to someone, how do you calculate the cost of a meal for two people? Well, in that case, you would say something more along the lines of, it's the cost of person A's main meal plus their drink plus the person B main meal plus their drink. And what you've done in that case is you've substituted the specific values for sort of symbolic names for things. And then you described how to combine those values in terms of the symbolic names instead. So now knowing that the total cost is, let's just write this down, total cost equals meal one plus drink one plus meal two plus drink two. You've got four variables here. You've got meal one, meal two, drink one, drink two. And that's all the variables are. They're a way for you as a programmer to give a name to a piece of information in the program you're writing. And later you can refer to it using that name and you can write equations and you can do things like that using these symbolic names that can be filled in later with different data rather than having to use the specific values right away. Like in the first example where it was $10 and $4 and $12, you can express things in terms of the symbolic names instead. Now that we've talked a bit about what variables are from a more abstract point of view, let's talk about them in JavaScript and how they're created and used. Now, as you recall, a variable is, you could think of it as a container for a piece of data that you want to save and manipulate. In, in JavaScript, we can declare variables to store data for use throughout the execution of the program. 
And we can do this using a special set of keywords. I'm going to go ahead right now and create a variable in the code using a keyword called let. In JavaScript, as in most programming languages, there are special reserved keywords that you can't reuse. There's a whole bunch of them. It's not overwhelming, but you'll just sort of learn them organically as you program more and more. So there are three keywords for declaring variables, and I'll list them right now. There's let, const, and var. So let var. Oops. And they all have very specific meanings and some subtleties between them. Unfortunately, this early on in the series, I can't go into detail on what those differences are just yet, but I'll dedicate an entire video to that later. We need to cover some more advanced topics like scoping before a description of the differences here will make any sense to anybody. For now though, use let, ignore const, and a bit of a tangent, but using var, it's just not good practice these days. I know, I kind of get it, I see tutorials all the time, uh, people using it, showing that in videos, but uh, yeah, do, don't do that. Uh, experts generally frown on its usage, and there's even automated code checkers like ESLint that have rules specifically in place to explicitly flag your code if you do so. So if you want to try, say, contributing to a major project that uses ESLint, maybe you're trying to build up your resume or something like that, you might have a hard time because it's going to flag you and you're going to have to make corrections to your code. Now, the world isn't going to fall apart if you use var. It works. Uh, there's huge long programs that can be written and work perfectly fine using it. But it's an outdated way of doing things. And if you're going to learn JavaScript, you might as well learn the most up-to-date way of doing. So for the time being, let's use the reserve keyword let to declare the variable. And we have to give it a name. So let's just go back here. Do, 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 do. We're going to give it a name. Now, naming variables is done in a very specific way. You can't just give them arbitrary names involving random characters, spaces. There's a very specific subset of characters that are considered valid for names. So here's the general way to name them. You can use alphanumeric characters. That means that you can use A to Z. You can use capitals or lowercase, so A to Z or A to Z, and you can use numbers, so zero through nine, but they can't start at the beginning of the name. And you can also use underscore. And the reason being that in JavaScript, like in most programming languages, a lot of these other characters, like let's say that uh, you're looking at your keyboard and you see star, the plus symbol, the and symbol, the hash, exclamation mark, there's, there's lots of them, just look at your keyboard. These are often reserved for special use. They have special meaning within the language. For example, in JavaScript, the star, so the star, it generally means multiply. So allowing you to insert that into the middle of a name would make things really, really confusing. So you just can't do it. Anyway, let's get back to naming. Like I said, alphabetic or underscore first, then alphanumeric and underscore is all you want. We'll call this foo. And at the end of the variable declaration, you add a semicolon, so semicolon. So the whole thing might look like, let's uh, write a few more out, let x, let So as you can see, each of those names adhered to those rules. I used alphabetic characters or underscores first. I could use capitals or lower cases, and I can use numbers, but not at the beginning of the variable name. Now we can actually run this. So we're just gonna go and run this here. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. And as you can see, nothing really happened. Uh, in actuality, something did happen. Those variables were all declared in the code. It's just that nothing happens. And so you don't see anything in the console. The way that you can tell something happened is that you have to use them in some way. Let's just look at the sources real quick. You can see here, this is a... Oh, 
Oops. So let's go back and use them a little bit and then we can see the result in the logs. Open the log again, expand that a little bit. We'll get rid of these old ones, let x equals 2. And here we go, we reload the page. And as you can see, after we reload the page, you two showed up in there and two showed up there in the logs after the other two messages that we wrote. So that's kind of cool. Now remember that we said that variables are containers for information. They're symbolic names. They're symbolic names for you to refer to them, but the information they store can change. So let's change the value of our x variable. So again, we go back to Chrome and refresh, and you can see that it printed two, and then immediately afterwards, it printed three, which means at the time that it printed two, over here, the value of x was two. You can see over here. And then over here, it changes to three, and then it prints three. Both of these log statements are identical, they're just console.logx, but each time x contains a different value. So let's get a little fancier now and declare a second variable, and we'll call it y. So we just log these out, it'll just say two and one, which is expected. Now if we go here and we say x equals y. So what do you think will happen in this case? If you're thinking that the x variable will now contain the same value that the y variable had, that's right, that's what's gonna happen. Just copy these log statements again, and down here. And you can see now that x is 1 and y is 1. And we can do some more things too. Let's declare a third variable. Now this is going to do exactly what you think it's going to do, which is It shows up as 3, because 1 plus 2 is 3, and x is 2, and y is 1. And remember how I said you can only use alphanumeric characters in the variable names? This is a good example why. x plus y is literally the value of x plus the value of y. It's not a variable that's named x plus y. So now what happens if you don't name them properly? It's pretty simple. JavaScript is just gonna throw an exception and your code won't run properly. So let's name a few improperly. Here we go. And we're gonna run that. So we're gonna call that x plus y because plus is not a valid character. So pl because plus is not a valid character for a name and uncaught syntax error, unexpected token plus, which means you weren't supposed to use a plus in the name. Let's use some spaces. So let the cost of a meal equal two. Again. Uncaught syntax error, unexpected identifier, basically meaning that it expected a single name and it got a whole bunch of different ones because of the spaces here. Let's put some quotes in there. Uncaught syntax error again, unexpected strict mode reserved word. 
so you know now roughly what constitutes a valid name and what constitutes an invalid name. The last thing we should talk about are best practices when naming. When you're writing code, one of the best things to imagine is could someone who's never read the code look at it and understand clearly and quickly what it's doing? Variable naming is really important here because naming something like, let's go bad. You've got a whole bunch of code here. You go and equals some magic number and let y equals three and let uh, an acronym DSFOP equal 78. Those aren't descriptive in the slightest. They don't convey any meaning to the reader or engineer or coworker who has to work with you and your code later. You might not even be around to describe what it's doing and they're trying to figure out what this means. In general, I try to use names that convey meaning and are as descriptive as possible to within reason, of course. So you use names like that. Now, you look at those two names and you are reasonably certain what values they hold. What I would personally recommend doing is hopping on Google and searching for JavaScript style guide. Let's just do that now. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of them. There's the Google style guide. There's the Google style guide. There's the Airbnb one. There's the JavaScript standard style. Google's is a good one. You can look at naming here, and you can see that the naming conventions that they use are pretty similar. Descriptive names. Don't worry about making them too small. You want to make them more immediately understandable, not by a new reader. Don't use abbreviations that are, un that are ambiguous or unfamiliar. Those are all solid bits of advice, and they really do help making your code more understandable and more maintainable later for someone else. So that about wraps up this video in the series. Stay tuned for the next video in my JavaScript crash course series. I plan to talk about data types, so I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.